My name is Dennis, and I am a research software engineer at Klima, the Climate Modeling Alliance, and I'll be talking today about using SciML for climate modeling research. So let's go right in. A brief overview of what I'm going to be talking about. We'll start off with an introduction. What is Klima? What are our goals? Then I'm going to move on to this package that we've been working on for the past year or so, which is ClimaCore.jl. I'm going to give a bit of mathematical background for this package and then go through the API that we've been developing. And then I'm going to talk about how we've been working with ordinary Diffie-Q's IMEX ODE solvers, uh, the heavy splitting uh, strategy for solving our uh, differential equations in a more stable way, and how we've been computing Jacobians, and what future work we're planning in terms of computing Jacobians more efficiently and more automatically, and generally future work uh, for cleanup. So we're a coalition of scientists, engineers, and mathematicians from Caltech, MIT, the Naval Postgraduate School, and the JPL. And we're using Julia to build an Earth system model that can learn from different data sources and generate climate predictions with quantified uncertainties. Here's a general uh, overview of what we're planning. We're going to represent all major physical processes on Earth that have large scale effects, uh, including advection of air through the atmosphere and sea ice and the effects of biophysics and so on. Uh, there will still be processes that we cannot resolve at the resolutions that our grids are going to have. And we are going to model those processes using subgrid scale parameterizations. Uh, in order to calibrate the parameterizations, we're going to use high resolution uh, simulations of small domains. These are called large eddy simulations. Um, and the calibrated parameters are then going to be fed into large uh, global circulation models, GCMs, uh, which have a coarser resolution, but can be used to then in turn tune the boundary conditions for our LES simulations. So some more technical goals of the Klima project. We're trying to create an open source code, code base that is easy to understand and can be uh, extended by a wide range of users, be it uh, domain experts who've been doing climate science for many years and new people who are just interested in the field. Uh, we want simulations that can run on both CPUs and GPUs, and we want to support a very wide range of different coordinate systems for our simulations. Uh, so the final simulations, both LES and GCM, are going to run in 3D, uh, but for the purposes of testing, we also want to be able to run in one and two dimensions. We want to use both Euclidean and spherical domains, uh, with Euclidean corresponding to our LES simulations and spherical corresponding to our global GCM simulations. Uh, we also want coordinates that follow terrain. So for example, the bottom of the atmosphere, uh, coordinate z equals zero, uh, should always run along with the surface of the earth going up when mountains go up and so on. Um, and we also want vertical grid stretching. So because uh, processes high up in the atmosphere uh, happen over larger scales and processes closer to the ground, uh, we want to stretch grids in the vertical direction. Um, and then we also want a wide range of different discretizations over the domains that we're working on. So for example, we want finite difference uh, discretizations, which is sort of the simplest case where you store the values of your state at a discrete set of points, and you can determine derivatives by taking finite differences of those values. And then we also want a set of different spectral element discretizations, like continuous Galerkin and discontinuous Galerkin, uh, where spectral element means that we're uh, decomposing our state into some a, some, a, a linear combination of polynomials and storing the coefficients of those polynomials. Um, and we generally want to be able to try out a very large number of different model formulations. Which variables do we use? How do we make those variables interact with each other? Uh, and we want to be able to very easily swap out different formulations and different integration schemes in order to determine what works best and what's most numerically stable. So it's very experimental work, and we're trying to come up with ways that make it easy for scientists to determine what works best. So moving on to Klima course, a bit of mathematical background. So at every point in the domain uh, x, we have some state at time t, uh, denoted by y of x and t. Uh, so as an example for a simple dry atmosphere, uh, the state could involve the density rho and the potential temperature theta and the wind velocity at every point u. Instead of theta, we could use, for example, uh, energy E or energy density rho E. Um, and then a set of conservation laws gives us an expression for the tendency of the state, so how it evolves over time. And in this case, I've written out the 
the tendencies for each of the three variables. It's advection plus source terms, essentially. And when the domain is discretized, we represent uh, the state of our system with a state vector. So for the finite difference case, this is going to be the state at every single location of our finite difference discretization for spectral element. This will be the coefficients of the, um, of the polynomials in every element. And when we do this discretization, differential operators can then be expressed as matrices that act on Y of T. And we're going to come back to that when we talk about uh, the Jacobian uh, computation. So because we want to be able to run our models on arbitrary domains, we use generalized coordinate systems. So here's a very brief rundown of what it means to use generalized coordinates. So in the 3D case, suppose we have three variables, psi one, psi two, and psi three, which represent our three special coordinates. Um, each of these corresponds to a basis vector, which tells you which direction x, your current position, is changing when you vary each of the three generalized coordinates. And then we also have a metro tensor, which is the set of all inner products of these basis vectors. And here's an example for uh, spherical polar coordinates, uh, lambda phi r, which stands for latitude, longitude, and distance from center of the sphere. Uh, a vector can be expressed in several different ways. We can have the contravariant components, which are uh, the values that you, or the, the coefficients of the basis vectors that you sum over to get the vector itself. You can also express it in covariant form by contracting the contravariant components with the metric tensor. And you can also get the Cartesian components uh, again through the metric tensor. And all differential operators are expressed as some combination of basis vectors and derivatives with respect to generalized coordinates and the metric tensor. I won't go through the details of this, it's not super important, because the whole point of Klingberg core is that it allows us to essentially sweep all these generalized coordinates under the rug. We want to be able to write code that uh, is the same regardless of which domain that we're working on, which makes it a lot easier to program and debug our models. Uh, so on the whole, Klingberg core is a suite of tools that allows you to specify three things. Uh, discretized domain, a state on that domain, and then a tendency uh, of that state. So we're going to start off with how we describe discretized domains. Uh, we call these objects spaces, uh, which, and we construct them by using a series of lower level objects, uh, with the lowest level one being a domain, which just says uh, a region, which specifies a region of space and the boundary of that region. So is that region periodic? Uh, if it's not periodic, what are the names of its uh, various boundaries? Um, and then once we have a domain, we can specify a mesh, which tells us how to break up the domain into a set of discrete elements. Uh, then on top of that, we have a topology, which adds connectivity to information to the mesh. So which elements are, or sorry, which element faces are adjacent to which other element faces. Uh, this becomes very important once we deal with distributed computing, uh, because we need, if we have a group of elements on one, uh, computational node and another group of elements on a different computational node, we need to know which elements are connected between the two com computational nodes to know which information to send over. Uh, and then finally, once we have a topology, we wrap that in a space object, which stores, which, which is kind of a pre-computed cache of all useful numerical data related to a topology. So it stores the coordinate of every point, it stores the Jacobian determinant, the metric tensor, and so on. Here's a, the simplest example of a discretized domain. Suppose we want a 1D domain that goes from z equals z min to z equals z max. And it has, it's non-periodic, so it has a bottom and a top boundary uh, and z element elements. And so this is how we would specify that. First, we give the domain, then the mesh, then the topology, and finally, the space. Here's a bit more complex example. So now we want a rectangular two-dimensional domain with a spectral element discretization with polynomial order and poly. Uh, and this time, the, the domain is periodic in both directions. So we can specify periodic equals true rather than assigning boundary names. And this is what the code for that would look like. So now moving on to what we can actually store on top of a discretized space. Uh, we call these objects fields which are a combination of a space and a set of values. These values are stored in a flexible data structure called a data layout, which allows us to experiment with different memory layouts. So for example, do we want the uh, first dimension of the way in which we're storing our data to be the horizontal uh, element or the vertical element? 
or the spectral element in or the spectral element node within an element. And so we can experiment with all of these different layouts. And in turn, that allows us to experiment with different threading, model, threading models for parallelization. Uh, and the values that we can store inside of a data layout can be arbitrary data structures, as long as they're representable by a single base type. Uh, the most common base type we've been using so far is Flow64, but you can also go further and store a field whose base type is dual numbers. And this can be useful for doing automatic differentiation, uh, forward mode automatic differentiation. So here's a, a kind of random example of a field that we can create. Uh, so this is a, a field that we're allocating that stores a name tuple, where the first value A is a flow of 64, and the second value B is a covariant vector with two flow of 64s inside of it. And so by passing in one of the two spaces we defined earlier, we can define a field over uh, that space that stores this particular type of value everywhere. Uh, and fields also define some helpful overloads, like sum, which computes the integral of a field, and norm, which computes the p-norm of a field. Uh, and one thing to note is that a field is an array-like object, so its space acts like the axes of the array, and the data layout acts like the array itself. And this can be very useful for broadcasting, which we uh, extend through operators. So Julia's broadcasting already works for any array-like object. A uh, broadcasted function gets applied element-wise to all of its inputs, uh, and uh, any scalar values that appear in broadcast expressions are treated like array-like objects, all of whose elements are the same value. And multiple, multiple functions that appear within a broadcast uh, are fused together. So we create this new function-like object or pseudo function that we can add to broadcasting. It takes one or more fields as inputs and outputs another field. It can't be used outside of broadcast expressions. Uh, it's, uh, its behavior is undefined. Uh, but when it's used inside of a broadcast, it gets fused with other operators and with ordinary functions. Unlike regular functions, operators are non-local, so they don't necessarily act element-wise. The value of a single point in the output could depend on the values at multiple points in the input fields. Uh, for example, when you're computing a derivative of a field at a single point, you need to know the values of the field at the nearby points. Uh, and also the input and output fields of a operator don't necessarily have to have the same space. So you could also do more advanced things with operators like remapping from one discretized space onto another discretized space. Um, all of our differential operators are implemented, sorry, all of our differential operations are implemented uh, through operators. And to give an example, going back to one of our earlier slides where I said that the tendency of density can be expressed as the negative divergence of density times velocity, here is a direct translation of that into code using the divergence operator. So on top of fields, we have this highest level data structure called the field vector, which contains one or more fields, not necessarily on the same discretized space. And this field vector provides a simple view into the underlying data layouts of those uh, fields that it wraps. And it's fully compatible with ordinary DFEQ. Uh, you can broadcast over a field vector, and that's equivalent to broadcasting over each of its underlying data layouts. And you can also use standard functions like copy, deep copy, fill, uh, and so on. Uh, so everything that gets run internally by ordinary DFEQ is defined for field vectors. So to run a simulation using any of ordinary DFEQ's explicit solvers, we just need to specify two things, uh, a field vector y, which denotes the initial state of our system, and a tendency function, which takes in the field vector y and sets another field vector, which denotes the time derivative of y. And this is always implemented as a series of broadcasts over the different fields in y, uh, typically using various differential operators. So now moving on to why we can't just stick with explicit solvers. The states of our models. Hi, Dennis. Sorry to interrupt, but you have three minutes left. Uh, just wanted to point that out. Um... It, it would be nice if we'd get a question as well, but I just wanted you to be aware that you have three minutes uh, left okay. on your talk. Sure. Thanks. So uh, I'll skip the details of why exactly we need to, uh, why exactly we have very skewed meshes. But suffice it to say, we have extremely skewed meshes uh, with much smaller spacing in the vertical direction and then in the horizontal direction. And that means that if we just use explicit solvers, we'll be very highly limited by the uh, distance in the vertical direction. So we need to treat the vertical direction implicitly. 
To do that, we split our tendency into two pieces, an implicit and an explicit piece, uh, with the implicit piece only including operators that act in the vertical direction. Um, and the Jacobian for a finite difference discretization is uh, much simpler than the Jacobian for uh, spectral element discretization, uh, which is why we end up using finite difference in the vertical uh, and spectral element in the horizontal. We do still stick with spectral element in the horizontal because it's more numerically stable with explicit solvers. Uh, here is the, the previous example with the tendency of density rewritten now using uh, heavy splitting, horizontally explicit, vertically implicit. And so the first line of DTD row of the DTD row broadcast computes the vertical component using just vertical momentum W. And then the two other pieces, the vertical component using the horizontal velocity and the horizontal component are computed separately in the explicit tendency. So the structure of our Jacobian uh, looks like this, where every column is completely independent because again, the implicit tendency only uses vertical uh, operators. So no column affects any other column uh, in terms of the final tendency. Um, and within each block of the Jacobian, so within every single column Jacobian, uh, we can uh, write it out like this, where we have the derivative of the tendency of each of the fields inside of the field vector with respect to each of the other fields. Uh, in order to simplify the computation, we do uh, set a lot of these blocks to zero, which allows us to reduce the size of the Jacobian when we invert it. And oh, let's see. Yeah, so the, the Jacobian in each, uh, sorry, each block of this column Jacobian is a banded matrix, and we have mechanisms for uh, writing out the uh, the definition, sorry, for computing each banded matrix, again, using uh, broadcasts through this extended broadcast functionality. So we have this operator to stencil function, which converts any finite difference operator to an operator that then generates a block of the Jacobian. And so it becomes very simple to directly differentiate our code. And this is my yeah. last slide. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> So yeah, more complicated uh, tendencies result in more complicated blocks of the Jacobian because derivatives sort of scale exponentially. Um, and as we add more and more variables and interactions between these variables, it becomes increasingly harder to write out the different blocks of the Jacobian. So we've been looking into automating away the process of computing the Jacobian for our implicit tendencies. And now ordinary DFEQ does come with a suite of tools designed for this, uh, but they're not particularly well suited for our problem because First of all, the sparsity pattern of our Jacobian uh, depends on the memory layout that we're using, and we want to play around with many different memory layouts. And also, these utilities for automatically computing Jacobians are really meant for arrays. And because we're using fields rather than arrays, this results in some inefficiencies. For example, there's no easy way to parallelize this computation across different columns. And so we're working on using field broad on further extending field broadcasts in order to completely automate the process of computing the Jacobian. And hopefully that will be ready within several months. And sorry. yeah. So thank you very much.